Welcome to TechSoup Talks. This is Candy Griffiths, and today's webinar is Assistive Technology for Public Computers. I am joined by Jane Vincent from the Center for Accessible Technology. I am the Training and Outreach Manager here at TechSoup. And Jane, can you tell us a little bit about your work at the Center for Accessible Technology? Greetings. I'm the Usability and Accessibility Manager at Center for Accessible Technology. I work directly with individuals, I work with organizations, I work with businesses, all toward the goal of making computer technology as accessible to as many people as possible. Um, can Jane be louder? Jane will try. <laughs> um, is that a little better? Okay. Um, okay. One thing I want to say, I did see all the um, comments that people uh, sent in in terms of what they would like to have covered today. Uh, we will get to as much as possible. What we don't get to today from the questions, first of all, we know a lot of people wanted to hear about website accessibility, and Cami and I are already talking about doing a follow-up training on specifically that topic. We um, um, unfortunately, I I have increased the volume as much as I can um, on the phone I'm on. I can try calling in on another phone if this is a problem. Um, we will be doing and uh, hoping to do another seminar on website accessibility, and I will be answering other questions that we don't get to today via the um, the online forum. So we will get to as much information as we possibly can. Great. Thanks, Jane. And I just quickly want to thank Kate Hereford and <coughs> Stephanie Girding for answering questions on the chat. Again, if you have any questions during the presentation, don't hesitate to send those in via the chat. I'll hold them. And if we can't answer them immediately, but we will hold them until the very end. I'd okay. like to get started by um, asking Jane, what is a, a, a assistive technology? Okay, so Cami, what I'm going to suggest, since people are having difficulty hearing, is it okay if I call in on another line? Um, I guess we could, um, yes. It, okay. It's going to take a few seconds for you to do that. Um, yeah, I, I will be right back then. Thank you. Sure. Okay. In the meantime, that's new. that hasn't happened before. In the meantime, I will take this time to hear from our audience what you're currently um, offering. If if you are someone who is currently doing this work and have something that you'd like to share, please raise your hand. And you're not and you're feeling okay. Okay. So Dave, since you already posted in the forum. If you wouldn't mind unmuting your line and sharing with the group a few of the things that you um, have learned in your using assistive technology. So star 7 to unmute your line. Hi, this is Dave. Hi, Can Dave. Hi. Um, okay. <laughs> so, I was going to have um, Peter share a few things. So just let's give him one minute and then we'll jump right in, okay? Okay, this is, this is Jane. Can people hear me now? We can hear you. Perfect. Okay. So Peter. Uh, oh, it's Dave, actually. Um, oh, Dave, we, so um, sorry. We, we have a, 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 a computer resource center for clients with disabilities that are conducting job searches. And our assistive technology basically is uh, kind of limited to uh, some adjustable workstations, uh, trackballs for people with mobility issues and motor issues. and. Uh, Zoom text, uh, of course, for people with vision impairments. But that's that's about what we use at this point. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Dave. And then we'll go back to Jane now. Let's just okay. quickly blow through just the broad term of what assistive technology is. Okay, so the way I think of assistive technology is it's anything that helps people negotiate their environment more easily. So for example, if you're a year old, a table might be assistive technology because it might be a very useful tool for pulling yourself up and learning to walk. If you're in school, a calculator can be very useful assistive technology because it can help you do math more easily. If you're out in the workforce, a 
day timer, a day planner can be very useful assistive technology because it can help you remember, remember things that you wouldn't be able to remember otherwise. And of course, for a lot of us, glasses are very useful assistive technology. They're not marketed as assistive technology. They're marketed as fashion items, but they're still useful uh, assistive technology for being able to see more easily. Great. So let's bring it to computer technology. Assistive computer technology um, often exists because computers aren't designed keeping the needs of all people in mind. So some assistive technology can be three-dimensional fabric paint. For some people, the little nubs on the keys that help you orient yourself to where the home row is aren't very easy to find tactily. So you can get three-dimensional paint for about $2 at any craft store and build up those little nubs so they're easier to feel. Built into most operating systems are some assistive technology that, for example, make it easy to use the keypad on a computer instead of having to use the mouse, or that make the monitor easier to see, or that make it easy to press keys in sequence rather than having to hold keys down simultaneously. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's built into the computer as well as some, some free assistive technology. Um, there are commercial programs that do a very good job of magnifying the screen um, so that if people can't see the default small print that's on a computer screen, there are ways to make the print larger. There are also alternatives to the keyboard and mouse. So that, for example, one thing about mouse design is if you can't hold the mouse steady, you may get the cursor where you want it and then inadvertently move it when you try to hit the button. There are technologies to help you get around that. Let's talk a little bit about what is expected of, of us by the law. Okay. Depending on the type of entity that you are, uh, you may be covered by federal law, you may be covered by state and municipal law, or you may be covered by laws relevant to private entities. That's in the U.S. Uh, can I see a show of hands how many people are not in the U.S.? Okay. Not seeing any at the moment. Um, oh, if you scroll up at the very top, we've got five people uh, out okay. of 138. Okay. So um, there may be other laws that cover where the country where you happen to be. Um, unfortunately, I can't speak to that. Um, for most uh, state and municipal entities, which is going to cover most libraries, they're covered by Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the key concepts under the Americans with Disabilities Act, Title II, first of all, equality of opportunity. So that if you're providing access to word processing as a general service that the library or the organization is providing, um, you need to provide access to word processing for individuals with disabilities. The second concept is reasonable modifications. And it's easiest to explain what reasonable modifications are by giving you some example of what some unreasonable modifications might be. So for example, if someone is asking for a modification that would cost a tremendous amount of money, that's not a reasonable modification. If somebody's asking for a modification that would be outside the scope of the services that your library or your organization currently provides, that's not a reasonable modification. For example, if someone says, as a person with a disability, I need access to the Internet, if your organization does not provide public access to the Internet, you're not required to change your whole group of services uh, simply to comply with Title II. Um, the third key concept is personal services and devices. Uh, and an example that I use for that is it's a perfectly reasonable modification 
for a library to provide pencils for people who've left their pencil at home. It's not a reasonable modification for someone to provide a pair of prescription eyeglasses for somebody who's left their eyeglasses at home. So for something that would only primarily be relevant to a single individual, that's not a, uh, something that would be required under Title II. Well, that's a great overview. Thanks for that. And so if I'm interested in integrating assistive technology, what's the first thing to think about? Okay. Um, I'm actually going to uh, – somebody had a, a good question about uh, whether other CTCs run by nonprofits are held to the same standard. Um, it depends on whether, on, on whether you're a state and municipal entity or a private entity. If you're a private entity, you would be covered by Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is – unfortunately, I don't have time to get into that in detail, but that is a uh, slightly different uh, – the, the laws is written slightly differently for private entities. So the first steps toward effective implementation, your, your best friends in this arena are going to be your users. Very often I get complaints from public computer labs that they've put in assistive technology and nobody's used it. And if you have a sense of who your users are and what they might need, you're going to have a much, much easier time being able to accommodate them. So you'll want to research your users. Ideally, um, you've interacted with people who have disabilities who've come into the library, come into your organization, and asked for accommodations in the past. There are also more passive ways of researching your users. For example, um, you may know from census reports or from other information that you have a lot of elders in your community. Um, and certainly for the next 20 years, all of us are going to have a lot of elders in our community simply because of demographics. Um, you may have a lot of kids in your community, which means um, often the accommodations that kids need are for learning disabilities. Although one thing that's, that's coming up in greater incidence every year are kids and young people needing accommodations for repetitive strain injuries. Um, you want to talk to your users. Ideally, you want to be able to get a focus group going to talk to people about what accommodations they would like, to talk to people about what accommodations they already use. Um, one thing to know, for example, about screen readers for blind individuals, uh, people often think that screen readers are milk and they're actually soda. And what I mean by that is when you go to the store, um, you don't have a lot of choices in terms of, of the types of milk you purchase, and people don't tend to have strong loyalties to one brand of milk or another. When you get to soda, people do have very strong preferences, very strong loyalties. And the same is true of screen readers. People tend to have very strong opinions about what screen reader they prefer to use. So if you purchase one screen reader um, that's not the screen reader that most of your, the people in your community use, that's not going to be effective as talking to people and finding out what they actually use. Um, and Walt, I love your comment, by the way. Um, involve your users. Users may be able to help out with training. Um, they may do that as, you know, a lot of people are volunteering these days as a way to get work credit that they can put on a resume. Um, ideally, once the economy gets better, hopefully, um, you'll be able to pay your users or, or otherwise uh, compensate your users if they're providing training or other services to uh, your other patrons. Great. So tell us about the different types of assistive technology available and who benefits. Well, there are a number of different ways to um, to organize types of assistive technology by disability type, 
by uh, computer platform, et cetera, what I've decided to do today is to talk about categories of technology relevance. And there are three categories I'm going to want to talk about. One is uh, technology that you're pretty much always going to at least want to consider if not implement. These are the technologies that are no cost or low cost and that are relevant to a general population. Um, I would say part of a general population these days, again, is going to be an aging population, um, is going to be people, because the incidence of repetitive strain injury is so high, you're going to need to assume that, that some people are going to have difficulty using the standard keyboard and mouse, and you're going to want to look at some of the things built into the operating system and so forth. Um, the second category is sometimes. Um, these are technologies that come up when you do your focus groups, when you talk to your patrons. These are going to have, usually have some cost, but it's going to be moderate. And the third category is going to be technology that seldom, if ever, is relevant to public computer stations. They're expensive, they're often fragile, they're relevant to only a few people, and we're going to be talking about hidden costs a bit later. Um, these seldom if ever technologies can be very difficult to implement. So the first category I want to talk about is the technology that's pretty much always relevant to public computer stations. And what I want to point out, the first thing I want to point out is the diagram for something called mouse keys. And mouse keys is built into the Windows operating system, it's built into the Macintosh operating system, it's built into the Linux operating system. I have a friend who works for Sun and who asked me to mention that Linux has more uh, assistive uh, technologies built in at no charge than any other operating system, and that's true. Um, Linux may not be relevant to your computer lab, but I just want to pass that note along. Uh, mouse keys is something that lets people use the keypad to operate the cursor instead of the mouse. So you press, if mouse keys is active, you can press the 7 key and it will move the cursor up and to the left. If you press the 2 key, it will move the cursor straight down. If you press the 5 key on the keypad, it will click the mouse. So this is a way a lot of people find the mouse very difficult to use. Mouse keys is something included in the operating system that makes mouse use very easy for a lot of people. One thing I will say is that um, for a lot of public stations, especially for where you have a large public computer lab, where you have networking going on, where you have security systems going on, uh, there may be difficulties with um, accessing the control panels and, and a very quick um, answer to Rachel, a quick answer to, to Kate's question, yes, you can get an external keypad for use with a laptop. Um, quick answer to Rachel's question, you enable mouse keys through the control panel, you enable most of the built-in technologies through the control panel. Um, there may be conflicts there with other technology already on the computer. And part of the answer to that is that you want to make best friends with your IT people. It's coming on Christmas, knit your IT people some mittens. Uh, because, as we're going to talk about a little later, they're going to be a tremendously important part of successfully implementing assistive technology. Uh, the second type of technology that you're pretty much always going to want to implement are very simple modifications that can make a huge difference. And what I'm showing here is an example of a large print key label. Um, keys. Standard computer keys are pretty wasteful because they only have the letter on about a quarter of the key. And that's really hard for a lot of people to see. But you can buy key labels that um, provide 
that that put the letter over the entire key so that they're much easier to read. They come in a wide variety of color combinations. Hi, Betsy. I, I will get to the question about mouse keys and, and laptops at the Q&A part. Um, you can get high contrast yellow on black, black on white. You can now get them um, black on a really unpleasant green, but for some people that's easier to see. You can get black on ivory. A variety of different color combinations that can make a huge difference in being ac able to access the keyboard for a lot of people. And they only cost about $14 to $20 at most. The third thing that I want to touch on under pretty much always, um, what you're seeing here is a logo for NVDA, which is one of a generation of free screen readers that people are starting to develop. Screen readers for blind people have traditionally cost around $900. Um, people are starting to develop open source screen readers. They, they're not as powerful as the commercial products, but if a library, say, is primarily offering internet access and access to Word and Excel, the free screen readers may be perfectly sufficient. And I've given Tammy a list of four uh, free open source screen readers that are currently available, and she's going to be sending that around with the follow-up um, email. She's also going to be um, sending around a, um, the URL that was also mentioned in the forum for a really terrific list of free assistive technology software. This assistive technology will not um, um, work necessarily work on all operating systems. That is something you're going to want to talk to your IT people about. But it's a great list of things to consider that that are at no charge that can be considered as you uh, start to think about what you want to put on your computers. So the second category is assistive technology you want to consider sometimes. And at the beginning of the hour, Zoom Text was mentioned. And Zoom Text is a very, very powerful magnification program that um, it costs $400 with speech, $600 without speech. Sorry, $600 with speech, $400 without speech. It may be overkill for the majority of your clients. The people who make Zoom Text also have a product called Zoom Text Express. And Zoom Text Express is $150. It doesn't have as many features. It's not as complicated if the people who are requesting magnification are primarily elders rather than people with severe, severe visual disabilities. Zoom Text Express may be a perfectly adequate accommodation. Uh, one thing to keep in mind as well is that if you have anything that speaks, you are going to want to get headphones uh, so that people can use their speaking technology in a quiet environment and so that other patrons aren't being disturbed. Um, the next thing I'm showing here is an adaptive keyboard. Uh, this particular one is called the Gold Touch. This is a keyboard that splits in the middle and can be angled. It's a lot more comfortable for people with repetitive strain injuries. It um, costs about $150. They just, it's a standard sized keyboard. They just came out with a laptop sized version. Because of its flexibility, it's a great piece of assistive technology for public um, uh, workstations because it is so flexible. Um, the next piece of technology is called WIN. WIN is a program designed for people with learning disabilities. You can scan, if you can attach a scanner to the computer, scan in information from textbooks, from magazines, from a variety of different sources. 
and Wynn will read the the text aloud and highlight it as it's being read, and that's very useful for a lot of people with learning disabilities. Um, Win is one popular program that does this. Kurzweil 3000 is another. So um, again, you're going to want to talk to your users. You may want to talk to the local schools and um, see which of those programs they're using. Another thing about programs like WIN, by the way, is they're tremendously helpful for beginning literacy or ESL programs. So a lot of these technologies are not just relevant to people, quote unquote, with disabilities. There may be other audiences for them as well. Um, Can I interrupt Wynn, real quick? Sure. Um, I need to, we need, we're running a little bit short on time, okay. and I want to make sure we have enough time for question and answer. Okay. And there was a quick question about the name of the keyboard. The name of the split keyboard is the Gold Touch. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. Um, two other things, just very quickly. Um, we have an alternative mouse shown down there, the Quill Mouse. Same population as the uh, but keyboard, there's also a touch screen. For a lot of people, the mouse is cognitively difficult to use. What you can do with the touch screen is directly touch a link or directly touch anything that's clickable and activate it that way. So for some environments, that's going to be appropriate. Um, Betsy, yes, I'd be happy to. Um, technology that you want to consider seldom if ever. We did have a question. Um, do you want to skip ahead to the assistive technology stories? Oh, my apologies. I think I accidentally no clicked problem. that. Um, the technology seldom if ever category, uh, we did have a question about voice recognition. Voice recognition is something I almost never recommend for public computer stations. If you're going to use it, you really have to have a separate room, which most public computer stations do not have, both because voice recognition doesn't work well in noisy environments and because people need privacy to use it. Um, it's very difficult. Uh, it also requires quite a bit of training. It's not Star Trek. Um, I'm not sure it ever will be. So it's a very individualized program. Um, the second that I would say at this point to seldom if ever consider is programs like JAWS, which are the commercial screen readers. Again, if you're only providing um, access to the Internet, access to, the, to word processing and perhaps Excel, then in a lot of cases the free open source screen readers are going to be perfectly fine. And then the third thing on the seldom if ever list are very complicated technologies. What I'm showing here is um, a, an eye gaze system, which is something that very few people would need. It's tremendously expensive. It's very delicate. It's very difficult to implement. So it's not really something that would be appropriate for a public computer lab. Okay, and thanks so much, Jane. And there's a lot of really great questions. We appreciate everyone um, sending those questions out. So let's hear about some different stories of people that you've worked with. Okay. Um, three stories. Uh, first of all, the Sorensen VRS, which I'm showing here is the picture of the guy signing. The Oakland Public Library and the San Francisco Public Library have worked with Sorensen to get a video relay service put in at no charge. We haven't really talked about technology for deaf individuals, but this is something that allows deaf individuals to directly sign to each other um, without an intermediary. So this is something that, that has been put into some libraries very successfully to allow access for deaf individuals. Um, inspiration. Inspiration is a great software program that allows um, you to map ideas into a flowchart. 
and then be able to uh, organize them into an outline and, and import them into uh, Microsoft Word. And the Alameda County Public Library System has installed Inspiration in all their computer labs. It's something where I've actually seen parents and kids come up to it. Um, the kids are able to get their ideas down in a free-form way that makes sense to them. And what tends to happen when I'm doing training on inspiration is the librarians always say, this is great for organizing ideas. Can I use this too? So it's a question of the tool being there, not necessarily having to have a label as being assistive technology. It's simply something that meets a need. Um, the third piece of technology is, um, and Peter's right, there are, there are free um, idea mapping web apps as well. Um, the third piece of technology that I'm showing is the IntelliKeys. Um, the IntelliKeys is a, a keyboard that has overlays that you can slide in and out. It comes with about 16 different overlays, but you can also create your own overlay. And we've worked with the uh, Berkeley Public Library to create overlays specific to their online catalog. So you can press a button and go directly to the author search or go directly to the um, uh, subject search. And what that particular overlay has is an, a keyboard with the letters in alphabetic order rather than in the standard QWERTY order. A lot of elders have never learned how to touch type. So particularly for them, but for others as well, having an alphabetic layout can make a lot more sense. There was a question that Robert had. What functions does Sorensen have that Google Video Chat does not? Um, what functions does Sorensen have that Google Video Chat does not? Um, I don't know that off the top of my head, Robert, but I will be more than happy to research that and get back to you. And if there's anybody in the audience who has experience with either or both of those, if you wouldn't mind sending your comment in via chat, we'd appreciate that. Okay, sorry for the interruption. So let's talk about some funding strategies. We know you've listed off the costs, and some of these things are very expensive, and we're lucky to have open source and other tools available online. But what if we do need to purchase something that costs you know, $1,000? What are some options? Okay, um, I apologize. I've just lost ReadyTalk. Ah, there we go. Okay, um, and I don't seem to be able to advance the slides, so Cami, if you would be kind enough to advance to funding sure. strategies. Um, so funding strategies is up there. Budget, friends, recycled donated equipment. Okay, so one way is to get assistive technology into the budget to get it, uh, if you will, mainstreamed into the, the thought process of purchasing technology in general. You know, when you're looking at purchasing technology for a library, you budget for, for security software, you budget for furniture, you budget for uh, a variety of, of different factors. If possible, you want to get assistive technology onto that list as well. Another strategy, if there's some piece of technology that people are particularly interested in that's expensive, you can um, go ahead and talk to, to the friends of the library or for other types of organizations, perhaps um, another type of, of um, organization that might provide funding to you and they would be able to they may be able to do some fundraising for that particular piece of technology. Another strategy is to um, look at recycled and donated equipment. Every in the United States, every state and every territory, 
um, is supposed to have a recycling program, kind of a uh, eBay for specifically for assistive technology, if you will, where people list technology that they have available that they no longer need that they want to recycle, and um, that it, that's just getting developed in California, but that can be a good way to find out about equipment at no charge or little charge that may be available that might be very helpful to your organization. Uh, you can also talk to um, manufacturers. Uh, libraries, public organizations can be very good ways for manufacturers to make products available to people who would not have a chance to see them and perhaps later adopt them for their own use. And so it's certainly worth asking if you can be a demo site um, for particular technology that you're interested in. So you mentioned earlier that there are some hidden costs. Let's talk about that. And then we have about five more minutes and then we're going to start, we're going to open it up for Q&A. Okay. Um, again, you want to make really good friends with your IT people. You want to make sure that the technology is not going to conflict with your existing setup. Um, and most programs that are not free do have demos available, so you can try that out. Um, you want to make sure that there aren't a lot of maintenance costs. Um, you don't necessarily always have to upgrade when a new version of a program comes out. Sometimes it may be an improvement, sometimes it may not be. So uh, in terms of maintenance, you don't always need to get the latest version of a program. Um, support, again, you want to make talk to your IT department, make sure they're completely aware of what assistive technology you're using so that if any problems come up, um, you're going to be able to turn to them for assistance. And training. Um, very often you will have organizations such as the Center for Accessible Technology that I work with in your area that can provide training to individuals who are coming not only to the assistive technology as neophytes, but to the computer as neophytes. And in terms of maximizing staff training, um, a lot of places, um, I, I've done training for a lot of public uh, computer areas. Uh, first of all, you want to think like a librarian. You can't memorize all the commands for all the programs. What you do is you memorize where that information is stored. You want to document, you want to create cheat sheets um, so that, pe that your staff can help people very easily get up and running with the basics of a piece of assistive technology and have a cheat sheet for local resources so that if people need more detailed assistance, you know where to refer them. For some libraries, I've developed flowcharts so that if someone comes in, let's say you have various technologies for people with low vision. Someone comes in, says, I have low vision. What technology do you have? The flowcharts give you questions to ask people so you can refer them to the appropriate technology. And again, involve your users. If possible, have people who are day-to-day uh, -day users of some of these assistive technologies come in and help patrons who are neophytes with the technology. Um, I think we'll hold these uh, resources for just a few okay. minutes and start okay. talking about some of these questions that we've had. So I'd like to start with one that hopefully will be a quick answer, which is uh, from, from Payman, what, uh, what is the difference between text-to-speech and speech reader? Okay. Um, there it, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, one thing I am going to, to make a distinction between is that there are programs designed, text-to-speech programs designed for the general public and or for people with learning disabilities, and there are screen readers for blind individuals. And the main difference 
is that, that blind individuals, of course, can not only not see the monitor, they also cannot use the mouse. So products that blind individuals are using need to only not need to not only speak, but they need to have some sort of alternative to the mouse interface. Whereas text to speech programs uh, very often will require mouse use. They do have uh, certainly an audience, but they are not appropriate for blind individuals. Thank you. And how much more, this is from Robert, how much more efficient is screen magnification over decreasing the resolution? Um, it depends on the individual. The screen magnification programs, not only a, you, the commercial screen magnification programs, usually not only provide straightforward magnification, they, always, they also give you a variety of options for what you want magnified. So for example, they have a mode that works like a um, magnifying glass so that for people with a low level of visual disability, you can, you can move a magnifying glass, a virtual magnifying glass around the screen, still keep the context of the screen, but magnify just what, what you want to look at. Um, they also have other features such as being able to um, make the cursor easier to find, which is very important for a lot of people. They have options for reading aloud in some cases. They have options for changing the contrast, which can be important to a lot of people with visual disabilities and with learning disabilities as well. So uh, if you need to go beyond simple magnification, then the commercial products um, go quite a bit further. And this is a good question about how do you show that your station is accessible? We heard from Dave earlier. He's got a special desk for it. Do you, have you seen some best practices around how you label what stations are accessible? Um, it, that it somewhat gets into um, a policy issue as well. And I don't want to get into this in a lot of detail, even though it is a, a complicated question. But one thing that you are going to need to do is to create a, a fair use policy. Some libraries and public computer stations simply have a sign that says, this is where the magnification technology is located, and anybody is welcome to use it. Um, some need to have a sign saying, this is where the assistive technology is. You need to register with us um, as having a disability before you're allowed to use it. So um, that's one way to get the information out. Another way, getting back to interacting with your community, once you've let the people in your focus group know, they're going to be very likely to go back to the local organizations they belong to, put something in their newsletter, get, send out an email, get information out to their community to let people know that the assistive technology exists in your organization. And there are several questions that are asking about open source versus the full price or the, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the off the shelf. And the learning curve that is faced, is it, you know, if someone's used to using JAWS, what's the learning curve if they're going to start using an open source system? Um, it depends on the open source system. For example, I've heard from a lot of people um, that they like system access to Go because the keyboard shortcuts are very similar to those used by JAWS. One thing to keep in mind for any screen reader is that 70% of the screen reader isn't actually part of the screen reader. It's part of the operating system. Windows has a large, large number of keyboard shortcuts built in. So for example, when you press the Alt key, it's going to take the, fo the focus to the menu bar. And that's not a screen reader command. That's an operating system command. So Depending on the open source, there may be something of a learning curve. 
but um, it's it's not going to be people starting from scratch. And then, as far as installing the open source, are there special instructions that they need to give to their IT person who's installing? Um, usually, even the open source come with installation instructions. Again, for any piece of of uh, assistive software, or, or really any software, assistive or not, um, the IT person is probably going to want to do some experimenting with it to see what the issues are going to be with the specific setup in their computer lab. So that's, that's another reason why it's a good idea to get the IT team involved, because they're going to be able to do some background work and see what the problems might be rather than simply releasing it to the, the computer lab and then running into problems. And earlier we were talking about laptops and the keypads because you were talking about mm -hmm. using the mouse through the number keypad. So mm -hmm. could you uh, mention again what do laptop users do if they want to use the number keypad for the mouse keys? The easiest way is simply to get a uh, third-party USB um, keypad and attach it to the laptop. Uh, one of the obvious advantages of that is if somebody is a one-handed, left-handed typist, then they can position the keypad over on the left side rather than being stuck with having it on the right. Um, and the USB keypad will work with mouse keys just as well as a standard keypad would on a on a desktop keyboard. And one question about the overlays that go on the keyboard and mm -hmm. um, how well they stand up to being wiped down. Um, what we usually recommend, the, the IntelliKeys overlays that come with, uh, the IntelliKeys are laminated, so they stand up fairly well. For anybody who wants to create their own overlays, um, you can go to any Kinkos and have them laminated. And not only are they going to stand up better, they can be wiped off. Um, they're also going to be stiffer. When you create an overlay, you print it out on a, on a standard piece of legal paper, so they're quite floppy. If you laminate them, they're going to be stiffer and much easier to slide in and out for a lot of people with dexterity disabilities. Excellent. And I know that Windows 7 has just launched, but do you know what accessibility uh, features are part of it? My understanding, uh, I haven't really had a, an opportunity to explore it a great deal, but my understanding is that what's built into Windows 7 is fairly similar to what's built into Vista in terms of having a very simple and not that great uh, voice recognition program. It's got a very simple magnifier. It's got a very simple on-screen keyboard so that someone who can't use a physical keyboard but can use a mouse would be able to move their mouse over this virtual keyboard and do input that way. Um, it has a very small program called Narrator, which provides a limited amount of speech output. Um, it has some limited options for being able to make the cursor larger. Again, these are all either accessories or control panel items. So if your organization has turned off access to the control panels for the public, um, you may need to either restore that on limited computer, uh, limited number of computers, or that may not be um, an access option that's appropriate for your particular situation. So we heard some of the open source solutions. Someone asked specifically about um, if you had any suggestions for open source screen readers. Um, what I did was I sent a list of the four open source screen readers that I'm aware of to Cami, and she's going to be sending that out as part of the follow-up to this, this um, 
webinar. I don't have specific recommendations. Um, there's there's one that's pretty much just web based, uh, so that's not going to work with word processing or other applications. Again, you're probably going to want to talk to the screen reader users in your community and see which ones they've used and they've found the most success with. And we didn't spend much time on the fundraising part, and I was wondering if you know of any particular grants for assistive technology. Um, I don't know of specific grants. Um, I do encourage people to be in touch with the Foundation Center. I also encourage people to be in touch with their local uh, assistive technology uh, center. Every state, every um, and and every Commonwealth of the United States has an assistive technology center at, within the state. We do have a link on the list of links um, that I can go back to if you like, Cami, um, that, that will get you to the Assistive Technology Center for your particular state. I think that's a good segue into these resources. So let's spend okay. a little time talking about these resources, which in the follow-up message, I'll send a PowerPoint. These are all links to their websites. but. The links will be in my email as well. Jane, did you want to talk about these specific resources? Okay. Yeah, if we can if if you can go to the links, I'm having some connectivity problems. Oh yeah, no problem. So right now but, I'm at the website for libraries. Um there are two that are library specific, maybe but maybe of interest to other organizations as well. One is a link to ASCLA's accessibility tip sheets. ASCLA is the branch of the American Library Association that deals with quote unquote special libraries um, and, and accommodating users with a, a wide variety of needs. And they have put together a very good set of tip sheets for interacting with people with um, disabilities including one tip sheet specifically about assistive technology. Um, the second link there is to a presentation um, that Marty Goddard from the San Francisco Public Library, Lynn Cutler from the Oakland Public Library, and myself did for the Public Library Association in early 2008. It's called No Grant Needed, and it's a list of uh, um, very low cost or free accommodations, not just computer based, but all types of accommodations that are appropriate for a library setting. So okay. then these last four resources that are not necessarily okay. library specific. Um, actually the, the ASCLA accessibility tip sheets are on there twice, uh, but they're worth mentioning twice. They're very good. Able data is um, a online database free of about 19,000 assistive technology products. Um, you can search by product type, you can search by product name, you can search by manufacturer. It's very flexible. And they do have a large range of products, low tech, no tech, high tech products available. The Association of Assistive Technology Act programs, this is something I mentioned just a few minutes ago. It's a link to a site where you can find your state's um, Assistive Technology Act program. These provide information about funding, uh, not only federal funding, but funding appropriate to your particular state. Um, they provide information about um, recycling programs within your state, um, who the training places may be within your state. They, there are just a wealth of information. And finally, Access on Main Street is an eccentric little blog that gives information about assistive technology features built into mainstream products. 
so for example, uh, usually they're, they're... I'm going to interrupt Jane because okay. we are nearly out of time, and I really appreciate okay. it. As it's very clear that Jane knows so much, and it's been really excellent to have you sharing this information. Here is Jane's contact information, and she has already expressed interest in uh, working with individuals. So if you have questions, feel free to contact her directly. I will be including this information in my follow-up message. And we do want to thank uh, a California funder, CETF, California Emerging Technology Fund, for uh, providing the, uh, the funding for Jane's time to be able to help with this project. So we want to um, thank them. And there were some questions that we weren't able to address, so I apologize that we ran out of time. But if you wouldn't mind copying down this tiny URL, this will bring you directly into the forum topic that I created for this webinar. If you have additional questions or comments or resources that you'd like to share with the rest of us, please go to that website and post that information um, as soon as you can. I will be sending the link in my follow-up message which you will get in about an hour or two. So I also wanted to let you know about an upcoming webinar that we're doing next Thursday called What Should a Website Cost? It will be posted on the TechSoup site sometime today, but I'll also include a link in the follow-up message. We want to thank ReadyTalk for supporting our webinar program and making these free to the nonprofit and library community. And again, I just want to thank all of you for participating today, and specifically Jane for all of her hard work in putting this presentation together, and Kate and Stephanie for answering chat questions. So thanks everyone, and thanks Jane. Thank you all. And look forward to another webinar on this topic or assistive technologies for uh, websites, hopefully in, in January or February. Have a great day everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Please stand by.